wish I could go to sleep and wake up a year from now and just be past all the hassles and all the crisis and all the problems that I'm dealing with. And unfortunately, we can't go to sleep, though frequently we act as if we're asleep. What our program is going to be today is for those people who are really sick and tired of being sick and tired, who are tired of relationships that haven't worked and want desperately for their life to work, but are willing to be open just for this two hours, open to a new perspective as to how we can change. It's about starting over. Now, I am of the belief that in every single person here, you have the capacity to change fundamentally who you are, what you're doing, and how you feel. I do not accept the notion that we should all have to go out to 12-step programs and countless therapy sessions, go out and read every self-actualization book, and still stay enamored trying to deal with the past when we keep using the past as an excuse to not actualize the present. If you cannot get out of the past, you have no future. The past is your future. The past is your present. Well, I think you've spent enough time in the past. I also think you've spent enough time seeing what does not work. But you have to suspend judgment. You have to be very vulnerable during this talk in order to even accept that there is another way of dealing with crisis and problems. If we're not open to that potential, then we have no future. Why? Because we keep going back to the same ways of looking at the same issues. If you were a battered child, if your father was an alcoholic, if your mother uh, gave you mixed messages. She said, oh, come here, and then she was harsh on you when you did. As a child, you don't know how to respond to this. Until the age of at least five or six, you don't even have an intellectual mechanism for self-survival. All you do up to that point is when you've been abused or hurt or denied or where there's any dysfunction shared with you, you try to adapt to it. You try to look at every single inflection, posturing, intonation in the voice, and try to understand, am I going to be accepted and loved or hurt and rejected? That's all you know. So you're, you become a creature of emotional adaptation. The trouble is, it doesn't end at that point. That's what you do as an adult. You start looking at the people in your lives to see who is doing something that's going to be supportive of you or challenge you. And if you weren't able to survive and if you didn't have proper functioning as a child, the likelihood is as an adult, you're going to carry that same manifestation on. You're continuing the same process. We don't just stop it. It becomes a part of us. It becomes a part of our pattern of behavior. So a boss figure comes in. And if the boss figure represents the authority figure of the mother or father, and if there was not unconditional love in that mother and father, what you're going to perceive of is, I've got to watch what they're doing, how they're talking to me, what their eyes are reading to me, what their body language is. And then I will learn how to respond accordingly. I will hold my tongue. I will not say anything. I will look away with my eyes. I do not want to stare in the eye of someone who is going to be aggressive towards me. I will look down. I do not want to self-actualize. Or I will feel disempowered, and I will feel hurt, and I will build up a rage and I'll walk around with a chronic anger and I won't know how to displace it. So I'll sublimate it. I'll create patterns of behavior that allow me to act normal on the outside to the whole world, but I'm going to manifest my anger through compulsive working, addictive behavior, perfectionistic attitude. Maybe if I make myself seem as if I'm so critical of perfection that other people will not challenge me. Or I'll become sexually addictive or relationship addictive, or food addictive, or gambling, or spending, or chronic busyness. The thousand ways that people manifest contempt for self because they never knew when to start changing the patterns of behavior because no one was there to encourage them. And by the time someone was, you were already set in stone. Unfortunately, most people spend most of their life re reliving those experiences. Recently down to the Healing Springs Ranch, we were having a workshop. During the workshop, people were suggesting that they had gone through a magnificent sweat lodge and talking stick ceremony. The talking stick is a Native American tradition where you talk to the spirit of 
your consciousness to the spirit, whether you call it God or any other higher self through the sacred stick. And through all religions and through all cultures, there are symbols that represent, in the mythological sense, something that is empowering. Whether it's the shaman, the healer, the reeb, the pope, we all have symbols that we turn to when we feel that our own power is not enough to justify or to explain our own life or feel comfortable in it. We seek out that which we have comfort has the answer. Well, one of the Native Americans have a talking stick, and it is believed that through the stick it is a part of nature and all knowledge comes, so people talk out. And when you hear people talking out, they're talking out anger and resentment and how they didn't get what they needed in love and attention and respect, and they were disempowered, and they were made to feel stupid. And then you go through the sweat lodge, which itself is a healing process, and that's all fine. And then there's journal writing, and you write letters of forgiveness, and you read the letter, and you forgive so you can let go. Now, what I find interesting is that a month later, the very same people were back for a reunion, and it was a great reunion. We had a lot of fun and learned a lot. But the very same ceremonies they went through, they experienced the same thing all over again. The same shouting, the same screaming, the same pounding, the same letters. That told me they didn't let go the first time. They were using it as a game. And if I did it next week, they'd be screaming again, <laughs> letter writing again. You've got to realize, it's telling you that you haven't let go. When you keep coming back to the same issues over and over again, you're not letting go. And there's a reason why, and I'm going to get with all this, because I'm a belief that we've got to let that go. We've got to acknowledge we either want to be in the present or the past. Which ones are going to be? It's about choices. And let's begin the process. I'm going to be asking you questions, and from these questions, I feel that if you're honest, and I'm not asking you to do this now, these are questions that you can spend time, reflective, introspective time on. This is not for you to ask anyone. Even if you're here as a couple, and we have many couples, your answer is not going to be the same as the other person. You do not have to have common experiences from the same question. It's yours alone. First. Before we can have a new beginning, we have to ask ourselves, what are our limits? I can't do anything unless I know what my limits are. We have to prepare for a new beginning, and what we're going to do now is prepare for a new beginning. All right, how do we begin? I make a list, and on the list, and I keep a chart in my room in my office, and I have a list of my limits. Now, there are two ways of looking at your limits. The limits that others have imposed upon you, including gender and society and family, and the limits you've imposed upon yourself with I can't, I shouldn't, it's not for me, I don't have the knowledge, the power, I don't have the control, the finances, I don't have the wherewithal, those self-imposed limits. Now add to that the limits of society. You're a woman, what are you doing, you can't do this. Remember, until not long ago, women weren't allowed to run marathons. They were physically barred from doing a marathon because the stupidity of the male model said, physiologically, your body can't handle it. Not only is that kind of rampant sexism still prevalent and absolutely dominant in medicine, but in all policymaking. With exceptions noted, the general rule is most men are dysfunctional. And I say that because I have to deal with these men. And I deal with what they perceive of as others' limitations in their own. Because you didn't have other men coming to the defense of women saying, yes, a woman should do a marathon, a woman should be in the Olympics, a woman should have the same opportunities we do, a woman should get the same pay, same work. Do you know that most sexism on the workplace when surveys were done were not because men wanted to have sex with women? Most sexual harassment, the vast majority of sexual harassment on the job occurred from men who felt threatened by the woman being better at what that job.
job represented and the man was afraid of the competition. So the only way the man could deal with a woman was not through fair and a free enterprise competitive system, who does it best? Instead, let me demean her, denounce her, ridicule her, let me make her feel uncomfortable about her own sexuality in this environment, let me make others make her feel bad about who she is so that they will lose respect. I'll objectify her. So it's a way of demeaning. No different than through the South and other parts of the world where for centuries black men were considered boys. Call a black man a boy and you take away his power in the eyes of those who accept the word has power. And unfortunately, even in the minds of many Afro-American men, a lot of what they were doing is overcoming the stigma that even their own culture had accepted, both intellectually and emotionally. So we've got a lot to overcome. And right at the beginning, you've got to ask, where did your limits come from? Because it's my bet that most of you have not done what you should be doing in life and have not actualized your own life because you've been living by artificial standards. Intellectually, you have not grown because you were told not to. Stay in your place. Raise children. Breed children. You're a breeding machine. You're a biological breeding machine. Be the mistress. Be the housekeeper. But do not think you can compete intellectually. That was the message sent out. Now there are more women running the marathon than men. And physiologically, they're better adapted. There are more women finishing the marathon ahead of men. They were right. A year and a half, uh, three years ago, there was a woman who came to the park. A woman, 67 years old, senior citizen, retired school teacher. Her name is Queenie Thompson. Queenie Thompson is an Afro-American, so she had three minority elements going against her, a woman, Afro-American, and a senior citizen. And we had a running clinic, and I said to the people here, I don't care how slow you are today. Today starts the process. Don't look at immediate results. Plan your life for the long term, not the short term gain. But I promise you this, if you stick with this and you believe as much in yourself as I believe in you, the day will come when you'll be a model for change for human beings of all backgrounds. Well, we went out and she was the last one. There were about 400 people. She was the last. In fact, she was so slow. When I, I asked one of the people uh, who were there, I said, is everyone in? Yeah. And someone said, well, no, there's someone still way down there. So I went down, and she was just barely moving. Just, I mean, just like this, just barely moving. And she was overweight, and she had some problems physically. And I went down the hill at 72nd Street in Central Park, and I said, uh, how are you feeling? She said, oh, she said, Gary, I, this isn't going to be for me. I said, why not? She said, well, I was kidding myself. I mean, my friend said I was stupid to come out here. It's a Sunday morning. You know, I should be with them out on the boardwalk talking about our aches and pains and, you know, <laughs> and, and who had a bowel movement and who didn't and what color was it and, and how long did it take and, uh, and, and how often we're seeing our doctor and when our children called or why they didn't and, and uh, how fearful we are and looking at every person as a potential mugger and feeling helpless. She said, that's how I grew up. And she said, Maybe I should be back there. I said, where do you want to be? She said, well, I want to be here. I said, I only care where your mind wants to be. I'm not concerned about your body. I care about the mind. If your mind wants to be here, then you let it be here. Now, you're going to be competing with all those people because those people are going to want you back where you belong. And please understand, Queenie, Every week that you come back and you feel better about yourself is going to make them feel worse about you. Because everybody who gets healthy, everybody who gets their act together, they hold up a reflection to those who haven't got it together. And you're going to get a lot of negative feedback. Handle that and everything else will handle itself. So she kept coming back and she was still the slowest. And she was with a man at 76 years old named Mortimer. 
and Mortimer couldn't even walk. I thought there was something wrong with his legs. He was wobbling all over like this, and he couldn't get his balance. And he again said, you know, this isn't for me, I don't think. And I said, Mortimer, if you want it to be for you, then don't place limits. Do you want to do this? And he said, yes. And then I asked this question, how healthy do you want to be? Do you want to be a little healthy, a lot healthy, as healthy as a human being can be? He said, I want to be as healthy as I can be. I said, fine. So he and Queenie both agreed. We kept encouraging them. They kept coming back. They never lost sight of the goal. And every time a voice came into their ear and said, oh, that's stupid, what are you doing? Act your age, act your age, act your age. They kept allowing that to go through them. And what they replaced it with is, I'm changing my age. I'm getting younger. Mentally, I'm going to have fun. You're old, and you have no fun left in your life. You've got prunes, milk, and cookies, and nighty nights. I want something else. I don't want to be in a condominium in Florida waiting to die. That's what she said. This past Saturday in Spokane, after the national championship for the 23rd time in three years, Queenie mounted the podium to take the gold medal. She's 70 years old. Right now, at 70, Queenie is a world champion. She won two gold medals at the International Games. That's the best athletes not only of America, but the whole world. From every country they came to compete in Finland, she took two golds and a silver. Now, Queenie Thompson is a completely different person. She has changed her personality. She is vivacious. Her body is that of a 25-year-old. Her body fat is that of a lean, tough athlete. Her disposition is positive. Her health is dynamic. Her cholesterol, her triglycerides, her blood pressure, her skin tone, the wrinkles gone. Her skin is as smooth as a baby's. No cellulite, not a ripple of fat on her body. And she doesn't come in last. She comes in first. My idea is that in every human being, there is a champion. Every human being. I've never worked with a person ever in my life who didn't become the best at what they could be. And that starts by accepting that you must have a new limit. Don't set your limits where you have been. Set your limits where you want to go. Otherwise, we stop where we have been, and we never go through it. That's the first rule. Forget the rules you've been taught. They're for a conditioned self, not for the new self. By the way, there were four other people who took golds, too, and all senior citizens. What or whom controls us? Before you're going to have a new beginning, you better understand what it is that you're afraid of because the moment you go to say, all right, I'm going to start over. I'm going to have a new life, a new relationship, a new attitude. I'm going to have a whole new me. And that feels good. Now, if you were, if you were the only person in your life, you could do that. But you have hundreds of people in your life from the past who taught you about control. So now you were taught authority is control. We were taught to believe in authority. So the authority figure says to us, what are you going to do? You're going to start taking vitamins? Why? Well, because I, I thought that if I took some vitamin C, it could help my immune system. And if I took some uh, vitamin C, eat an orange. You don't need vitamins. But I read some literature, and it showed that vitamin C helped stimulate antiviral and help the skin and help the muscles. I'm the doctor. Who are you going to believe? Your own experience or my word? And we will deny our own experience and believe the authority. So immediately we're controlled by all the authority figures. So look at the authority figures in your life because the control and power over your life is going to be dictated by the reality that they told you to accept. But reality is a matter of perception, but they've even controlled your perception. Let me give you an example. 
I had two people coming to the park, two men. Now, these are regular Joes. They work, uh, both ironically work for the city. One is a sanitation worker and one is a police officer. And they came on Sunday mornings for about six months and they did the marathon and they were a lot of fun and they're nice guys. One of them kept coming back and still is. The other stopped. So I called the guys home and I said, what happened? What was wrong that you didn't come back anymore? And he didn't want to really tell me. And his wife got on the phone and said, I don't want him coming back. I said, why? He said, well, because it's disrupting our family relationship. And I said, here's an example. Two men, both married, with families. One wife encourages the husband to grow. The healthier he is, the happier he is, and the better the relationship. She doesn't see that he going off to the park for three hours on a Sunday morning and being away from the family for three hours and a whole seven-day week is a threat to the family. He's not growing away from the family. He's enhancing what he shares with the family. So the whole family encourages. The children look at him as a hero. Daddy did the marathon. They were there. It made them very proud of him because they knew what it took to do the marathon. The reality was the same for both. They both came. They both ran. They both did the marathon. The reality was the same. That perception was a healthy one that looked at it as a way of giving freedom to a person to experience something. As a result, the perception of what was being done was positive. The other viewed any growth as a threat to the relationship and therefore made the children even feel that the father being away was depriving the children of attention. So as a result, the children began to complain that the father was away from them even though on Sunday mornings, at the time he was out, they never did anything anyhow. And the children never was with him, but it was an excuse. Now, I said, did you watch your husband do the marathon? No, I was with family. She didn't even want to watch or participate. She said, you're going to hurt yourself. It's negative. Uh, you're going to end up injured. We're going to have to pay medical bills. She created a perception of that experience that was so negative that it tried to make him feel such guilt that he had no opportunity to grow from that experience. He had to pull back from his own growth experience. He had to deny his own reality. He had to change his perception to meet hers. Now, when you looked at her, she was overweight. She was a chronically angry person. She looked at the negative in everything. And what she shared was bitterness, cynicism, and mistrust. Never in any conversation that I spoke to her, did I ever hear her talk about anything with optimism, openness, vulnerability? Never. And yet the experience was the same. That's what I'm trying to share with you. Reality doesn't have to change. Our perception of it does. So changing your perception of reality is how you grow away from people who've controlled you so you can set new limits. Otherwise, if you, younger in life, if you tried out for a sport and you didn't succeed the first time out, you've made that your perception of that reality. Oh, I can't do it. It's too hard. I'm not fast enough. I'm not strong enough. And therefore, you stay away from things because you put artificial restrictions on yourself. You could just as easily say, I can be as healthy, as fast, as dynamic as anyone out there doing anything. And after all, let's face it, everyone who succeeds in life only does so when they first change their perception that they are going to be a success. No human being can be a success at anything until they think themselves successful. You must see in your mind yourself as successful. You must see yourself as a winner. You must see yourself crossing the finish line. Part of the guided visualization we do when people are training for the marathon is get them to visualize themselves crossing the marathon. When they're training, they visualize crossing the marathon even though they can't even walk a block. Because I don't care about today. I care about the process that leads to when you do this. And that's true of anything. I don't care about the fact that you can't cook anything. If you have it in your mind that you want to be a chef, then you have to visualize yourself self as a chef in front of a banquet table of the best-looking gourmet food in the world. At that point, 
you're creating the notion of success. You're creating your reality. You're reinforcing your right to have that reality. But even dreams are taken away from us. Even our desire to project is taken away. Be realistic. Stop dreaming. If you're daydreaming again, all these negative things from our past, all those limiting thoughts that made us feel as if we weren't good enough, even in relationships. Be realistic. Look at you. You're homely. Look at your nose. Look at your teeth. Look at your lips. You don't have an upper lip. Your teeth are crooked. Look at your breasts. One's big, one's small. Who's going to want to look at crooked breasts? Look at, look at your kneecaps. They're wrong. All you have to do is get enough of those messages, and then everyone you look at, you think, oh, no, I can't, you know, they're... And a self-depreciating value. Because you've learned the lessons from authority and power that did not love you unconditionally, allow you to be who you are, and did not say to you, you're as beautiful as a human being can be. Because people who feel beautiful inside, who feel an inner beauty, they exude it externally. And any woman and any man who feels beauty inside radiates. I'm attracted to the woman who smiles. But we have to realize it's always more enjoyable to be with someone who has a light heart and is open and who's effervescent. That always attracts everybody. You like being with people who have a lightness and who can laugh at themselves and laugh at life, who can laugh at our imperfections and accept them. That's the normal way of being. Self-depreciating is not. So what you do when you self-depreciate, you immediately put a limit that should be out there right in front of you, and you never go past it. How many times in the world have you seen someone in some environment that you want to go over and just say hello to? You, you were excited, you wanted to meet. And there's nothing wrong with natural attraction, whether it's emotional, intellectual, whatever it is. That is part of being a human being. I don't believe in this right way of communicating. Right, oh, hello. Where did you graduate from school? Oh, Ivy League, one for you. Do you own a rent? Rent, not very stable. Uh-huh, uh-huh. Alimony, alimony, how much? What's left over? Not good, not good. I would have found you attractive, but I don't see what you have left to give me. <laughs> the way that we judge each other is foolish, but that's not you judging. That's what you've been told you need to feel good about a relationship. And how many times are we judged based upon what we have to give someone materialistically or through our ego projections or codependency rather than giving our heart and our humor? One of my best friends is here tonight, friend for 28 years, June 5th, Ron Milkey. Now, Ron and I, in many areas of our life, are absolutely opposite, but we agreed long ago we wouldn't share what we are opposite in, we would share what we have in common. And we have many things in common, starting with our capacity to laugh at everything. I've never been with Ron that we didn't laugh about something. And also, to let things be what they are instead of saying, well, I can't go there because it's this. I can't do that because of that. In other words, having so many expectations before you do something, you never do it because your expectations you feel are never going to be met. Well, I would go to Club Med, but my God, it's going to be a lot of bimbos and gigolos and wiggly bodies and stupid people. How do you know? How do you know? How do you know it's not just going to be a fun time where you can go and have the sun and fun and surf and relax and play? You can put so many things in your mind before an event that you never experienced the event. And how many times have we not gone to opera? I have male friends of mine who've never gone to opera. Well, I don't want to go to opera. I mean, opera? What do I look like, Gary? I mean, you know, I'm a, I'm a, I'm a volleyball freak. You know, I like to pound it down people's throat, or I like soccer. I mean, if the guys knew from Brooklyn that I went to opera, forget it. You know, they think I'm some kind of, you know. So what? Is your image that important? I took a friend to the opera in Verona three weeks ago. It was a late night opera in a theater that was 1,200 years old, a Roman amphitheater that had 25,000 people to see La Boheme. He had never done that. He was overwhelmed when they, huh? 
in Italy. <laughs> and yeah, and, uh, and as a result, when we came out, as we were walking down the uh, steps, I looked up and he was crying. And I said, what, what's wrong? He said, I, I just realized that here I am at 40 and how much of my life I have denied, how many beautiful things I could have experienced that I didn't because I was prejudiced against it. I convinced myself I wouldn't like it, so I didn't engage it. And I'm angry at all the things I didn't engage, and I'm angry at all the stupid things I've been doing and calling it fun that it wasn't fun. It was repetitive and boring, but it was the only thing that I felt I was supposed to do. And he said, I'm never going to do that again. Never. And that's a lot of people. So you've got to ask yourself, are you being open to allow things to be experienced without pre first prejudging them to death? Because you're not prejudging them. Who or what controls you has already set the standard. His father, who has a... Uh, uh, leasing company over there. His father is the kind of guy that, you know, it's a hey and a an oh and a an ooh and, you know, in months and groans and single syllable communication. You know, there's no chance for poetry. There's no chance for any form of sublime enjoyment. There's no ecstasy in that life and there's no bliss in that life. It's kind of, hey, this is our lot in life. You got to stick with it. If I'm working in the garage, you got to work in the garage. You're no different than me and my grandfather and my grandfather and all of our aunts and uncles, and that's why we all live in the same community. Because we haven't got the courage to move anyplace else and follow our bliss, so we stay in a collective little group and we protect our interests. Now, who are you going to be as my son to go out there and experience something I haven't experienced? I'm your father. Honor me and respect me, and don't do anything that I haven't done. That's the message. And how many daughters have done the same thing? They stay in their place. They miss life. They never have their own life because they were told by those in power and authority who control us, it's not your life, it's my life. You're the extension of my ego. I expect you to honor my ego. And I'm going to do everything I can to make sure that there's enough emotional minefields around you that you'll never take a chance at anything because there's going to be so much guilt on the front end and fear on the back end that you'll be caught between fear and guilt. And so we stay in this limited little area. We have boundaries all around us. We're terrified. But somewhere over there, we see something that we think could be happy. We look outside of ourselves. Why do you think people look at movies like, or films like, uh, 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 pardon me? Well, not, not Casablanca, but uh, uh, Dances with Wolves. People who lived in a different time and learned about a different culture and the Native Americans from their perspective. Because their view of the Native American is going to be their view of blacks, their view of Jews. They're not going to engage them. They're not going to understand them. They're not going to learn from the richness of any other culture or belief because their own belief is all they have been allowed to trust. And when your belief is the only one you've been allowed to engage or trust, you're limiting, uh, you're limiting yourself to a splinter of life. There's no whole of life. 